Welcome team. Now you guys know when I say the word team is I want to bring to you people that are at the top of their game in anything, across any sport, any business, any form of life. People that can handle pressure situations and, and today I find myself with someone who's handled pressure situations more than I can even imagine. <laughs> um, Matt Hall, thank you so much for, for chatting with us and taking the time. Pleasure. Uh, I've heard so many stories about you and I've I've started uh, doing a little bit of homework before today. I really want to just kick this off with the introduction to your book. It talks about one of the most frightening moments. Like I read it for 20 seconds and I was in. I can't, <laughs> I can't put the book down now. So talk, can you talk to me about that eight seconds of your life that no one will actually believe un until they hear it? Yeah, so I was, uh, was in combat operations in, um, over Iraq in um, 2003, flying with the United States Air Force, and I was in a two-seat uh, fighter jet. I'm in the front seat, and I've got a I've got a weapons systems officer in the back seat who's responsible for locating targets and shooting them, um, and also providing me information um, so I can fly the jet effectively. Um, it was night time. We were in an environment I was not all that comfortable being in. We were, we were a bit lower than I'd normally like to be because of some a situation we were we were dealing with. I was in a right-hand turn, um, uh, my lead was out in front of me, I'm on night vision goggles and uh, I look, I'm looking down clearing underneath us just to make sure nothing's, uh, nothing's being shot and I see a missile uh, get fired um, and it blooms and it just starts racing forwards. Um, at this moment my back seater, he's seen it as well and he says, uh, looks like something's coming up at us, <laughs> which is not that good information. Um, but I, I'm seeing it already, and it's, and it's racing forwards, and I go, right, it's going out that way, it's nothing to do with me. So I, I do my first defensive manoeuvre, um, I reverse my turn and come back aggressively in this direction and look underneath the jet to make sure it's still going that way and I'm clear of it. As I turn, it then turns with me and keeps coming up this way, and I go, that's interesting. The missile here. Yeah. You thought, oh, that's no problem. Yep. So straight away you kept your cool, that's mm -hmm. no problem, I'm going to turn. Yep. You've turned, the missile's following you. Yeah, so you go, maybe it's a coincidence. It's most likely not. I'll give it one more test, so I reverse the turn and come back the other way. Now I'm putting a lot of stuff out of the jet to try and decoy the missile. I come back this way and it's come back with me. I'm like, okay, it's definitely on us. Um, and my backseat is not saying anything now, he's just staring at it. He, he should be putting... Um, expendables out and he should be communicating to me and the other aircraft you know, um, break right sam launch um, and and telling people where to go and what to do i've got nothing so at that stage it's like okay it's on us uh, i then go into my last ditch maneuver because it's a very short engagement for the altitude i was at uh, and rolled over the rolled to go over the missile and at that point i lose sight of it because it's burnt out so i roll i can't see it and it was no kidding a roll it was just like we're either going to blow up or we're not. I finished the roll and went, I don't know if it's past us or not yet. So I'd do another one just to be safe, just to try and keep it away from me. I don't know where it went. I don't know how close it came past us, um, but it missed us. Stop it. <laughs> Basically, you can imagine I'm at about 20,000 feet, yeah, uh, flying along uh, over, over, black. over pitch black over Baghdad. And I just happened to be in a right hand turn like this. And I saw the launch. I went, that's interesting. I tightened slightly, came back this way to look at it and pull, and it came with me. I went, that's not good. Came back this way, looked at it again, and went, it's still with me. I pulled up, went over the top of it, I lost sight of it, and went, it still might be on me. Rolled over it again, and it lasted that long. Wow. <laughs> that's, wow. that's how long it took to her. Everything is good, and I'm about to die, and everything is good again. Mate, that's unreal. So where was this again? This is overhead Baghdad uh, in 2003 um, at night time. It's pitch black, mm -hmm. you notice a missile coming. This all happened in eight seconds. It was an eight second engagement, yep. One wrong move and you're dead. Pretty much, yeah. So if, um, if we hadn't have seen it launched, um, uh, that particular missile didn't give us uh, warning uh, indications inside the cockpit for, for some certain reasons that were known about at the time. Um, so if we didn't pick it up, it most likely would have taken us out. Uh, so I was fortunate we picked it up visually um, and then fortunate that uh, instinct and training kicked in to just do what was required to uh, defeat the missile. That is very interesting, the instinct and the training that kicked in because you just mentioned the, the guy sitting behind you, he, his job was to communicate, right? That's right, yeah. 
but all of a sudden, in eight seconds of your life where you could actually die, he decides not to communicate. Exactly. So you still have to know your job. Yeah, and I think part of that, the, the good side that was on my... my Did on you my, sack him, by the way? I, I threatened to uh, climb over. After we got out of that, like we, we flew away and I threatened to cl unstrap, climb over and beat him up. Yes. <laughs> He'd, we didn't really get on that well for the rest of my time in, um, living in the States. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. But um, the thing that was on my side was I was um, trained in Australia, so, and yep. I was still an Australian fighter pilot on an exchange program. Um, and I flew single seat Hornet. So I was used to operating um, on my own, on your own in, yeah. a, in a single seat aircraft. So um, it was supposed to be a benefit to have the back seat. And that's, we actually went into more uh, higher risk situations because we had two people in the one cockpit able to do twice as much work. Right. Uh, whereas it ended up that um, you know, I was effectively in a, um, a single seat environment in a high risk environment. Um, but because of my training being a single seat pilot, um, just, survive and uh, and keep the jet alive kicked in and uh, was able to get away with it wow i could I, I just can't even imagine like what type of training led you to that point to keep yourself so cool and calm in eight seconds when there's a missile on you yeah like i just i'd like to go there i'd love to know your journey how you know you said you trained here in australia like when did it start like when did you when did you start this training, or when did you even see yourself, hey, I want to be a fighter pilot? I guess, yeah, I, I was always going to fly planes. Um, you know, I've been flying uh, with my dad since I was knee high, and so I was always going to be a pilot. Uh, I, it wasn't until I was just leaving school I decided I was going to try the military. Um, I had no military heritage, or I wasn't in the cadets or anything like that. Um, but um, you know, I went through the, the, the pilot training, was sent straight back um, to fly fighters. So uh, as a, in my early 20s, I was on, uh, on the F-18 and uh, I was identified by some of my um, superior officers as somebody that could actually um, do some more higher level training and, uh, and, uh, and, and go somewhere. So uh, I was selected to go on to our version of Top Gun, um, our fighter combat instructor course. And that's where you really become effective at um, not just the basics of flying a fighter is if there is such a thing you know yeah. all the fighter pilots are, you know, are very very capable of, yeah. of operating their aircraft but uh, when you go on this course you know think of yeah it's a bit cliche-ish but think of top gun we are we're now training to a to the next level yeah. and that's where we really worked on um on my particular course we really started to work on aggressive um uh, surface to air missile evasive maneuvers and uh, we we were you know, this is back in 1999, and we were we were one of the first. Um, it was one of the first times in our uh, Royal Australian Air Force that we put a dedicated program together to train against surface-to-air missiles in, in a very aggressive fashion, uh, rather than just go you know, go this way, hope it doesn't hit us. It's how to actually engage the missile back yeah. and beat it. Um, so. That training we did in 1999 to a point where we produced a, a paper and a document on this is now a new doctrine within the Royal Australian Air Force of how we operate against SAM systems. Um, it, it's, it's amazing that you, you never know how you're going to react in a high pressure environment um, after doing a lot of simulations and training. Yep. Um, but what I found is that you know, if, if you have the right, the right mentality and the right, um, the right brain space, um, if you've trained well, when the pressure comes on, you fight well. And that's exactly what happened. Um, uh, when we reviewed the tape after the, after the engagement, everything was clear cut, calm, precise, uh, even to the point where uh, after the engagement, I called the engagement on the radio and separated exactly as we did in training and without any emotion in my voice. The emotion only started when I then threatened to, um, to climb over the back seat. <laughs> wow. So, it when you've when you've trained well you fight well that's that's definitely a line straight away that i mean in in my world i've, I've worked with elite fighters i've worked with world championship fighters and and i could sit here and tell stories of the the those real big moments in sport have come from someone very similar who who's everything ticked every box in preparation and then if i take you to a, a rugby league environment or or last year's State of Origin series, for example, my, my role on that game is to run out on the field and give coaches direction and coaches yep. messages. Uh, and I would go out on the field and I, I just heard our, our halves or our, you know, our leaders of the team, the halfback who's 
you know, running the game. Yep. I didn't actually need to say anything. Like he, he was already saying what the coach was telling me to go tell him. So I, I would just go and listen. And and James Maloney, it was. I don't know if you follow rugby league, but he just keeps his cool in yep. pressure moments. He, he, his voice was very calm, uh, very. Um, you know, direct focus on the next job, but but it was very calm and relaxed and clear-minded. And then when the boys become free and just express themselves and play, like it's, it's it's an exciting environment to be a part of those high-pressure situations. But I'm still trying to get my head around a high-pressure situation with a missile. Like I, that's going to take me. I'm going to have to read more into the book to soak that up. That's incredible. So you went from you mentioned you wanted to. So you obviously had a talent. Someone recruited you and said, hey, this kid's got talent. I'm gonna, he's gonna go from just a pilot to this level. Like, you obviously, that happens in sport too. We have talent scouts mm -hmm. out there. We go find the, the right ones with the right mindset, the right physical traits and whatever. But was there ever a dream, like as a 13 year old or a 10 year old or like, like where did you decide I love planes? Um, I don't remember deciding I love planes. It's just. I always knew I loved planes, so yeah, it probably happened when I was three or four, I guess, as I say, flying with my dad. But um, it's it's one of those things that um, you know, the way I compare it to most people is say, do you remember when you decided you were going to get a driver's license? You just kind of assume you are. You just and, get that, one. and that and that was how I was. It was more of an assumption I'm going to be a pilot than it was that I'd drive a car. So, in fact, I flew planes before I could drive a car. I used to have to get a ride to the airport with my parents so then I could go flying. On your own? Yeah, yeah, so I'd... Stop I'd, it! Yeah, so, so I, I was flying planes. You didn't have a car license, but you could just go flying. Yeah, I was, I was flying aircraft solo when I was 15. Wow. So I had to wait another two years before I was allowed to drive on the road. Wow. So, that well, that can't be cheap, right? Like, that's... Well, it, it's um, everything you can... In aviation, it can be expensive, um, but uh, I was able to do it quite cheaply in gliders. So um, right. at the time, gliders were 20 cents a minute to, to, to fly. Right. And uh, my dad was a pilot, so he would, um, he, he would tow me up and he'd pay for the, for the launch because he's towing me, yep. uh, whereas normally that's the most expensive part of flying a glider is okay. getting launched because there's a powered aircraft towing you. Yeah, yeah, so because yeah. he was flying the plane, he'd pay for my launch because he's getting the flying. Yep. And, um, and then I'd just be 20 cents a minute, um, part-time jobs, pocket money. We lived on a farm, so I'd, you know, I'd uh, feed all the horses and the cows and fix the fences and all that sort of stuff to get pocket money. So then um, about once a month, I could go and have a lesson. Right. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, over a one year period, started when I was 14 doing my, my lessons. Yeah. And then uh, when I turned 15, I was now old enough and also had enough experience in the lessons to, uh, to get my license. Probably, yeah, in, in hindsight, it probably cost, um, yeah, maybe 50 bucks. Wow. <laughs> wow. A bit different now, though. A bit I'm different sure. now, yeah. I mean, we're sitting, in a, we're sitting in a hangar now with your own planes behind me, and this whole airport's yours, right? Oh, I'm, a, I'm a shareholder in this airfield. There's five of us that own it, but yeah, to, and I used to fly here as a kid with my dad. That's so, a great um, story. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's one of those things that the, the wheels turned. You know, I, I, used to, I used to come here with my dad and we'd rent an aircraft so I could go and fly, fly in a few circuits. And you know, here I am now as a, an owner of this airfield. And um, you know, I think we own about six or seven planes on the field now. Yeah. Um, and you know, I get to fly whenever I want and I employ people to fly my planes. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's quite a... It's quite a path that I'm pretty proud of. Yeah, well, I mean, yes, yeah, so I've turned up here and I've, I see joy flights happening, which, which is an unbelievable service for anyone up here on the coast. It's a beautiful coast. Oh, yeah. I, I see joy flights with planes with your name on it. Like, you must pinch yourself sometimes. Um, now you're a CEO of a business, but you're also an athlete. Like, that's, mm -hmm. That's really interesting to me. You're a very, very elite athlete at the top of your game where we haven't even gone there yet with the, the Red Bull racing. How do you balance this CEO life of a pretty amazing business, what I've set my eyes on today, mm -hmm. and also being a pro athlete? It's, um, it's a learned uh, experience for me. Uh, you know, I, I, I learned how to be a manager um, and a project manager um, in the Air Force because you know, I was a wing commander when I retired, but I'd still fly. But that was over an 18 year career. And then I started racing from scratch where I now had to start a, a, a company, which as an Air Force guy, you don't own a company, you're, you're managing Air Force people. And I had to run my own aircraft and run a team and travel around the world. And um, 
I was trying to do everything, thinking, yeah, yeah I'm, you know, I'm a manager, um, it's my business, it's my plane, and I'm the athlete. The flying bit's the easy bit, and I actually crashed a plane doing it. So I had a, had a, a, an incident, and, uh, and it was actually Larry Perkins was the first guy to get in touch with me and, and said, blatantly obvious what's going on there, Matty, you're, um, you know, you're trying to be everybody at once. And he goes, yeah, I nearly killed myself in racing so many times by being the team owner and then my brain's engaged in, in management while I'm going across the top of Mount Panorama and, uh, and nearly kill myself. And that's oh, exactly what happened. So it's been a learning environment for me that um, I need to be physically and mentally as perfect as possible when I'm, when I'm physically racing planes, yep. which requires a lead time and, you know, and, a, and a personal coach, you know, both physically and mentally to get there. Yep. And then when we've got the downtime, I'm working on um, the direction of the business, but I invest a lot of time with my employees who I see as peers. You know, yes. they're, they're my managers. And I invest a lot of time with them to make sure they're all going in the right direction. They have the tools they need to do their job. Um, they have my confidence to do their job. And then when we get to racing, I can just back off and no kidding, become the athlete. And I actually hand over the reins of my entire business in race week. I have let go completely, which is the key to collect, go completely and just go, it doesn't, if the plane's not uh, fast, it's not my problem, I'm just the pilot. I'm just gonna do the best I can with what I've got. Okay. Which is a very hard thing to do, but you've, that's, as the athlete, you've just gotta focus on your performance and, and avoid, uh, avoid the business mindset. Wow, so, hey, that's, that's a real juggling act for a lot of athletes these days, because. There's a lot of athletes with their own businesses yes, on the side, yeah. I mean, some athletes, their sports, they need it. They treat, they, they are the business, you know? And then, you know, I mean, there's young athletes in, that are getting caught up in a lot of other things where if you talk to a really experienced campaigner, they finally work it out that forget everything else and just focus on, yep. on this and, and focus on whatever their, their profession is and then everything will take care of itself. But some of them get caught up with a lot of head noise like, and that head noise could include just reading through a social media comment the That's night the before, classic, a, isn't it? before a game, yep. you know, like, yep. so in, in your sport, if you're, I'm, I'm clearly getting a message here that you are very, very committed to having a clear mind when you fly, when you compete, because it has to be, because you said you crashed a plane, I crashed a plane because I didn't have a clear mind. I even specifically remember taking off for that flight thinking, okay, what's on now? <laughs> I was actually got airborne going, right, I haven't even put any thought into this. Okay, off we go. Relying on instinct and previous knowledge and ability, thinking I can just get in there and do it, and crashed the plane. And talk us through the crash, where was it? Like, uh, is, is that the one I've seen a picture in the book where the wing hits the water? Yep. Where was that? So that was um, in the Detroit River, um, uh, in between um, the city of Detroit and the city of Windsor in Canada. Right. So it's right on the, the border between the two countries. Um, I was racing in qualifying and I stalled the aircraft, which means the air gets disrupted across the wings and the plane wants to fall out of the sky. Um, when that happens at uh, about 20 feet uh, in an aircraft, it's you know, you're normally gonna say it's gonna be fatal. Um, I was able to get the plane flying again, but while it was losing height rapidly, um, it, it actually rolled me on the back. I, I got it upright again, um, but I hit both wings into the water as, as I stabilized, um, and the landing gear hit the water as well and tore some parts off the aircraft. Um, and I was able to regain control as the, it skipped. Just prior to flipping, I was able to rego regain control and it didn't flip. And then I was able to fly it back to the airport and land. And the whole thing from uh, the G-stall to um, coming back out of the water uh, was about 0.6 of a second. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> so you weren't prepared. Mentally, you weren't prepared. I mean, obviously you're prepared. You had the training all these years. But it still goes to show for every single performance, you've got to be 100%. clear. 100%. Yeah, exactly. And so I was, I was probably 95% clear. But when you're pushing, when, you know, I was 95% clear in my head what I was doing but I wanted to push to 100% of ability. Right. And there's that last 5% that was missing, which is what got me. So the closer you go to your maximum capacity, um, the more important it is that you are 
completely ready because it, it goes exponential at the end. You know, to get yeah. that last 0.1 of percent, you know, the effort is almost vertical. Yes. So I tried to take that last 5% of effort um, with only being 95% ready, and the delta is enormous because of the uh, you know the uh, the effort required. Yeah. And I just wasn't prepared for it, uh, thinking I was. You know, it, uh, complacency, arrogance, uh, ego. You know, I was new to the sport, thinking, yeah, I've got this wide. I used to fly F-18s. I can do this, and nearly killed myself. Wow. So when you went back and reviewed that, what did you put in place from then on? So you obviously acknowledged that at the time, and then what's your routine? What what have you come up with? Yeah. So it was one of those things that uh, if you have a if you have an incident um, in a sport that's uh, you know whether it's going to be a near-death experience like I had or whether it's a complete failure in the sport where it's, it's really just you know, sponsors, ego, all that sort of stuff, fans are disappointed in. You, you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to look at it. You can't just go, don't know what happened there, fingers crossed it doesn't happen again. You've actually got to address you know, what, what caused it. And you could say what caused mine was that you know, I stalled the aircraft, but that's not the cause. That was the result of something much deeper. And we dug down and, and we found... Um, we found uh, three root causes um, of, of what was going on there. Um, the first was the plane was, was actually unstable. Um, you know, we had an issue with the aircraft, um, but we thought we didn't have time to fix it, which is an incorrect mindset. So mm. one, we fixed the plane. Secondly, what we did is we realized that um, I didn't trust the team to do their job. So I was being the micromanager on everyone in the team which then meant that I wasn't focusing on myself, but it also meant that the team stopped doing their job because they're going, well, what's the point of actually going and doing it? Because he's just gonna come along and tell me what I've done wrong. So yeah. it, just, it just results in a shutdown of the team. And I was creating the shutdown of the team by micromanaging everybody. The third thing that was, uh, that was an issue was I'd become complacent at doing my primary job. I started to think I could do everything uh, and it was more important that I told everyone else what they should be doing. And I, I stopped focusing on my own performance. And at the end of the day, that's what teamwork is about, is you've got to be able to work as a team, but the, the most important thing in teamwork is making sure that first and foremost, you do your job to the best of your ability because the rest of the team's relying upon you to do your job. Don't be telling everyone else how to do their job and screw up your own job. Do your job first. When that is 110%, you get some breathing space, you can now assist the other people doing their job. But uh, my team say it to me all the time still. They say, we'll be having a late night working on the plane and I'll be saying, can I help? And they're like, you, the best way you can help is go to bed and fly the ass out of this plane tomorrow morning when we've fixed it. Oh, I love that. Now, even just that message gets us on another topic. You're, you're, you're getting the tools ready. You've got the staff, you've got the resources, they're getting the plane ready, but they've just told you to go home to bed. That brings us to probably your own health and, and sleep as one of the most important things in, in an athlete's or any person's performance, daily exactly. performance. If exactly. you're not sleeping, but if you're not sleeping, you might kill yourself. Exactly. So you got little routines in place there for your own health and your own... For sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a very routine-based person. Um, Is that yeah. from your army? From yeah. the military, from the military, military yeah. training yeah. that, you know, it's a... Uh, yeah, from it, back in uh, Roman times, you know, go and, you know, the, the troops had to go and paint the, um, paint the stones on the side of the track and, uh, you know, and then and a route march just to go somewhere and sit there and, and make your lunch. It's just to stay in process because if you sit around waiting for something, your mind yeah. wanders and you're not in process anymore and now you might sleep during the day because you've got nothing to do and now you can't sleep at night. So I'm very much process based and, um, you know, that, that ranges from, yeah, before we go to a race, we'll plan what we're doing each day and then I'll plan my timelines of what I'm trying to achieve and I'll plan how much sleep I'm trying to achieve um, during the week, pre-plan it, how much sleep I'm trying to achieve because I'm generally dealing with jet lag as well. Right. So uh, we have a travel plan of how much sleep I should try and get because obviously you don't want to sleep all day on an airline if it's a day flight and arrive like, so you know, try and stay awake a little bit but not run yourself ragged on being tired when you get there. Um, acknowledging that uh, if you're traveling to Europe, I'll, I'll probably need to go to bed by seven o'clock on the first night and just let myself wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning to get a good solid seven hours, rather than trying to force myself in a time zone and stay up till 10, still wake up at two and now only get four hours sleep. Yes. And slowly transition yourself across. And then lastly, it's, um, you know, my team manager is very good at it, 
he, he talks very clearly, he goes, if it's a high pressure race, you know, it's the, it's the final, you know, which, uh, you know, and we were racing for the world championship. He said, just acknowledge that you're not gonna get a great night's sleep on the last night. And so that when you wake up at two o'clock in the morning, you don't need to panic because there's nothing worse than lying there in a panic mm-hmm. because you're never ever going to go to sleep now. So just acknowledge it, just say, yep, I've got enough sleep in the bank. I've got sleep all week. If I only get four hours sleep tonight, I'll still do my job in the morning and acknowledge it. And then you fall asleep because it's, you're not panicking you're about not panicking it. You're panicking about it. That's, that's a great message because, I mean, you think, well, you know what it's like, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of fighters that are the same. The night before a fight, it's hard to sleep. Not mm-hmm. before a big game, it's hard to sleep. Exactly. Um, but that's a really good way to put it. And you've already planned for that. You've already planned that that will possibly happen. So yeah. when it happens, it's no panic. Exactly. We've got all this here. And, and, and panic, yeah. panic and fear only occurs when you're projecting uh, a negative result in the future. So you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night and it's you know, the next day's race, race day or fight day or grand final day, if you start worrying about the result of tomorrow um, and what might happen if I don't get back to sleep, you're done. You're not, you're not going to recover from that. So you just have to have a system in place so that if you wake up in the middle of the night, tomorrow night, you know, is a, tomorrow's a big day, you go, well, we've already put, put a plan in place. And you go, I know what the result is. I'm just going to get less sleep and I'll be fine. Yeah. And there's no panic. So yeah. everything we do has been you know, dissected. You go, if this happens, what are the options? We don't want to do that. We want to do this. Okay, so here's the option. You go, can we handle less sleep? Yes, we can. So, okay, go to the next point. There's nothing to worry about. Yes. The next point is, hey, oh, if I'm still awake by four, I'm going to go to the gym. In the, I'm going to go to the gym at four o'clock in the morning and just go for a, an hour walk on the treadmill or something. You go, oh, yeah. that's fine. And then guaranteed you'll fall asleep and miss your, miss your walk and you'll be like, I'm disappointed, I fell asleep. <laughs> so yeah, turn it into a positive. So you mentioned the gym, obviously you need a lot of gym work in, in, in your profession. You're dealing with some crazy forces in mm-hmm. those, those planes and keeping your body in shape. So you're keeping your mind in shape. Are you doing any meditation or anything? Yep. Or obviously physical training, you must do. Yep. So yep. Both, both of them. So I've got a, um, I've got a, um, a sports psychologist and uh, you know, we do, yeah, just all the normal sort of um, sports psychology things. You know, it's uh, positive thinking, um, uh, preparedness, breathing, uh, you know, just uh, lying down, you know, palms up, deep breathing, you know, basically self-hypnosis and meditation. Yeah. Um, I'll do that um, with 56 minutes till takeoff. I have an 18 minute meditation session where I completely shut down and come back out again before I get in the plane. Yes. Just to be completely clear and void of any distractions. It's like, how, so I can wake up from that, from that with half an hour until I get in the plane and go, my life is so simple. All I have to do is get in a plane and fly it. And I can do that. And it just... Well, because you've prepared for yeah, it. Yeah, and it's just so simple. You just said 58 minutes before you hop into a plane. Is that what you just said? 56, yeah. 56 minutes before yeah. you hop into a plane. You do 18 minutes. That sounds pretty regimented. Yeah. So you probably, I'm guessing you know what you were doing at the 60th minute as well because yep. you know at the 56 minute mark i'm going to have 18 minute meditation and then what's your routine after that 18 minutes so um after the 18 minute uh meditation then there's a there's a, about a four and a half minutes where i will um get up go to the bathroom because generally hydration is a big big point so you know like every 20 minutes you're out to the bathroom yep. after the bathroom come back deep breathing stretching just getting my body active again you know, some squats you know just yeah. like boom i'm ready the next um, six minutes is sitting down, review my goals for this particular flight, which have been pre-written. So the goals are improve this, this, and this. So you're keeping very, very uh, focused on what you're working on rather than like, I've got a whole flight to do. The whole flight's easy, and yep. we're now gonna narrow the focus down to here. I'll then review the previous flight I did on a video and go, that's what I did last time. I'll visualize what I'm going to change differently. I'll then walk through the track. I'll then take about four minutes to get dressed in my flying suit, um, and then I'll walk out with the team and the plane out to get weighed, and then we take that then out to the starting point where I'll strap in, and then from strap in, I'm completely um, away from any decision process at all. I just sit in the plane, completely shut down and relaxed until my team tell me it's time to start. So I'm not watching the time, I'm not waiting for the siren to go off, I'm just sitting there until my team tapped me on the shoulder and, and, that, and they don't even talk to me. They just tap, so I'm not talking to anyone. I'm sitting there completely shut down. They tap me on the shoulder. I then 
put my helmet on, disconnect my comms, reconnect, close the canopy, wind up, crank and go. Fascinating. Well, you know, the best, the best athletes of any sport have similar, similar routines, similar focuses, but what I'm, what I'm just soaking up here is yours is always very high risk taking. Like yours is, well, it's life or death. Like, it, I mean, you did it in a combat situation, but you had that near experience in a competitive, you know, like it's, yeah, so you come out, obviously you have a plan, you have a race plan, you trust it, you commit, you're trusting your team now, you're committed to it, but it's still something else for me to sit here and listen to these stories, because it's, you're obviously a bit of a risk taker. I'm actually not. It's, um, it, no way. I, I have a lot of people say, oh, you must be an adrenaline junkie or a risk taker. I'm not. So. Um, it's, uh, it sounds funny, but um, ev what you're also probably hearing from this discussion is that every single thing I do is absolutely pre-planned. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so a risk taker would be someone that goes, you know what, I'm gonna jump in my plane and, um, and just go for a quick fly and fly between some poles. That's risk taking. Whereas I'm happy to fly between some poles, but I'll spend three days yeah. preparing it so that there's not a single thing happens um, that I'm not expecting. And I actually hate adrenaline. Um, if I, you know, so I don't skydive, I don't do anything that gets adrenaline because um, if I get adrenaline, that to me, and has always been this way for me, adrenaline to me says, pull out. You know, you, you're, you've lost control. Adrenaline kicks in when, when you don't know what the final result is going to be. It's like, you're doing something, it's like, I'm losing control. I don't know if I'm gonna go that way or that way. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna stack it or stay upright, whatever it is. So if I'm in a plane and I get adrenaline, that means that I'm no longer 100% certain on what the result's going to be. Yeah, not talking performance result, talking survival result. So if, I, if my body ever kicks in and says, you're on the edge and you might crash, adrenaline will kick in. And if I get that, my first response is get away from the ground. So wow. I've trained adrenaline to me, is a, it makes me feel sick in the stomach when I get adrenaline, because to me that says, stop, you're at risk, stop. Yeah, so for the average person, racing planes and flying planes seems risky, but it's not risky for you. No, it's, it's, it's so pre-planned. Yeah. Everything's planned. Yeah. And I got adrenaline in that crash, obviously, um, and I hated it. I, I hated yeah. the feeling afterwards, you know, the shaking, the, the like, can't, everything is now speeding up and it's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. whereas I like, you know, when I'm racing, it's actually, for me, it's a magic carpet ride. When, I, when I'm completely in the zone, um, I am just, smoothly cruising around the track, just just enjoying the moment. And um, I don't even feel the G, I don't feel the plane turning. I feel like I'm upright, just sidestepping around pylons and then, and then I come over here. It happens in slow motion. So how fast are you going? About 400 kilometers now. 400 kilometers and you feel in slow motion. That mm -hmm. must be magic. Yeah. That must be magic. It and, is. And, and the, the uh, you don't even feel the Gs that would make any person like me sick obviously pass out yeah pass out. most people pass out about 4g and we're going up to 12. and and actually you just said enjoying the moment we've got to go there because anyone i work with if it get they usually they start as a like let's say you think of a rookie that enjoys the moment and yeah. usually plays their best mm -hmm. and they always go through this this period of stress maybe or you know some athletes go through over analyzing things and and usually, the best ones, they get through that. But do you know what? They finally end up in their career at the back end going, I just need to go back and enjoy what I do. Like it's, For sure. you've just mentioned you enjoy flying at, and you're in, you're in a bit of a zone there. It's slow motion for you. At 400 kilometers an hour, I would be sick or passed out. You're enjoying that moment. Yep. Did this happen to you? Like, cause that happens yeah. to athletes. For sure, yeah. So um, when I first started air racing, uh, it's exactly that. I didn't care, care if I came last. Now I did, but but I was more of the opinions like, I'm one of 15 guys in the world doing this. Woo! How good! I'm flying a racetrack. Yeah! How good is this? Yeah. And 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 you fly really well. And then uh, in my second year of racing, in fact, when I had the crash, I did I did quite well in my first year. I, I got ranked third in the world in my first year of racing. So everyone went, Hey, you can you can be the world champion next year. So my focus changed from, Woohoo! I'm in the track to come on, I've got, to, I've got to do better, I've got to go faster. And like, ah, I, I made a mistake. I, you know, I can't afford to make a mistake next race, get back in there. It's like, don't make a mistake, don't make a mistake. As opposed to, righto, here we go, I'm racing again. So 
Uh, and that then led to the crash as well, because I was, you know, that was one of the things where my mind wasn't on the job because I was so focused on the result that I stopped following the process. Yeah. Right. Um, so we reset and went, you know what? If you're not enjoying it, you won't win anyway. So you have to enjoy it. And how do we enjoy it? We go, well, the only way you can enjoy the sport in the end is to have a good process and make sure that you're not focusing on what the final result will be. You go, I don't care if it, what the final score is going to be at the end. All I care is that I get through this next set of pylons perfectly. And same with you know, football or anything. You go, you know, ultimately, yes, you do care. You're lying if you say you don't care if you win or not. But you go, I'm not thinking at all about the final result when the siren goes off. I'm just thinking, I'm going to put this guy on his ass in the world's best tackle. And if you focus on that, you go, yeah, nailed the tackle. And you enjoy Ooh, that part. And you enjoy yeah. that part yeah. instead of worrying about you know, what will happen in 10 minutes' time. That, that's a key thing you just mentioned, enjoy your work. Because it shows, you know, like it, it, I see it in athletes. You, you see it, obviously. You even see it in your own staff. Yep. If they're not enjoying their work, you probably, you, you might need to help them because you need everybody to enjoy their work. And it shows, you know if they love coming to work or they don't. Yep. Right, have you got that, I mean, you've got yourself as an athlete you've, with that frame of mind, but have you got that with your staff? For sure, and we work really hard to achieve that as well. So, um, you know, we, you know, with my sports psychologist, we work with the team as well, because if the team aren't enjoying it, uh, it rubs off. And the, the, person, the person is actually um, liable to make mistakes as well. So when you're not, when you're not engaged in enjoying it, um, you, there, there's a, a number of reasons you may not be enjoying it. You may not be enjoying it because of the, the pressure and stress, which means now you're gonna start making mistakes. You may not be enjoying it because you're over it and you're sick of it, which probably means you're being complacent and uh, not, not worrying about you know, the focus. Or you may not be enjoying it because um, you'd rather be somewhere else because there's a problem in your life. You know, there might be sick relative, or et cetera, et cetera. So you've got to make sure that if those things are happening, we've got to, we've got to remove that person from the position and put someone else in because in, you want the people that will lean forward and uh, a good team is someone that stays with you with the enthusiasm regardless of the result. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely love it. In fact, I'm going to try to... I'm going to follow your career more closely now and I'd love to come and watch your team in action as well, like the, the detail that goes on because attention to detail in, in every industry is so crucial but the staff that you're trusting, you, their attention to detail has to be spot on. My, my life is in their hands. Yeah, yep. yeah, I'd love to watch that. Could I just finish with maybe, I mean, I've gone down the sport track there, but I, I'm just so in awe and so respectful to people that fight for their country. Like, can, is, can you just share with me, just finish off like some, some either really proud moments, or I don't know, is there any scary moments? That first one still got me going. Like, like the sport bit's great, and I think the business bit looks like a whole heap of fun, and you're, you're an amazing, successful person, and I want to bring the listeners people at the top of their game and you're, you're at the top of your game in business and in sport but what you did in uh, as a fighter pilot like you were in the most risky situations in the most powerful jets in the world am I right? Yeah pretty much the F-15E was the uh, was the final uh, the final one there yeah. Wow and to, like I don't know anything about planes so the F-15E what is what what is that? What does that look like? Um, so it looks like a um, yeah, like a, a jet fighter, as you'd expect. Um, but it's a very large jet fighter. It's only got two seats in it. Um, can travel at uh, twice the speed of sound. Carry a huge amount of armament. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing aircraft. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's bigger than an F-18. Um, and it, it, I only flew it for three years on the exchange program, but. Um, I, I happened to be in America on that aircraft when uh, America went into Iraq um, on Operation Iraqi Freedom and I went in with my American squadron um, as, as an Australian officer still um, flying their aircraft in combat operations. So it, it was an interesting um, situation in my life and it's, uh, it's one of those things that there was um, some very proud moments um, uh, there. Uh, I, I feel like I did some, some, some things that um, were worthwhile. Uh, there's some quite sad times of my life from when I was there as well. We did, we did lose a jet and uh, and, and lost the crew. Um, and you know, there, there's 
th there's memories, um, yeah. But um, I guess probably one of the um, one of the most amazing feelings of accomplishment uh, on the military side of things, the operational side of things, was uh, yeah, I was leading a four ship of uh, F-15s one night, um, and I was re-rolled into um, southeastern Iraq where there, were, there was uh, some Marines under heavy fire, and they were losing people, and. It was night time and I brought my F-15s in there and we started supporting them. Um, but before we could neutralize the threat that was engaging them, we ran out of weapons and uh, we couldn't do any more support for them. And um, it was devastating to have to leave them on the ground. Uh, and, and, and I promised the guy, I'll find someone to come and help. And as it turned out, I was on the radio trying to find other fighters to come and help and I couldn't find any. Um, so I ended up flying back to our base in, um, in Qatar. Uh, which is about a 50 minute transit. Uh, in the middle of the night, jumped out of a jet. I'd organized two more jets, jumped back into another jet with my wingman, went back out there and, um, and they were still taking fire, but we walked in and we just, uh, we, we cleaned up the threat and saved them. And uh, I remember coming off that thing with him basically crying on the radio, flying out of, uh, of Iraq at you know, 50,000 feet. Uh, we had quite a bit of fuel on board because it had been a, a very quick, a quick extraction at the end. And, uh, and you know, after burners on, as we're coming out supersonic, just gone, we, we just, we did a good thing. Wow, so you see, just, <clears throat> you just save people's lives and risk your own. Honestly, I could talk all day about that stuff. I can't imagine the detail. I've, I mean, I've seen, you know, you see, people training planes flying like this close to each other and I mean I'm used to dealing with uh, uh, football players for example <laughs> where we, we need to move together yep synchronized yep in a straight line talking yep. to each other communicating trusting each other mm -hmm. I can't imagine doing that the same thing but at 400 kilometers an hour or twice the speed of light or like, honestly, mate, you are the most impressive person I've had on this <laughs> podcast. And I want to come back to part two. Perfect. What a legend. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks so much. So if people want to come and meet you, we're here. Um, and if they want to come for a joy flight, they can actually go with you, can yep, they? Yeah, they can go with me as well, yep. And yep. I heard you fly helicopters too, is that right? Yeah, fly helicopters, yep. <laughs> so you, you, you fly missiles. You, <laughs> you go from flying with missiles, you fly helicopters, you fly joy flights. Um, I saw a Red Bull plane out there before, so people can go in that Red Bull yep, plane. Yeah, they can go in our Red Bull plane with us, yep. So. The skydiving bit, I, you can come skydiving at this airport, but you're not an adrenaline junkie, so um, <laughs> you, he doesn't go with you on that one, but this is a day out for anyone. Um, this is the first time I've been here, and I'll, I'll bring my kids back. And we'll We'll have a joy flight before. Where are we? What's the airport called? Lake Macquarie Airport, just, um, just south of Newcastle on the Pacific Highway. Okay, and the Matt Hall Racing? Yep, matthallracing.com, and uh, we show what we can do. Uh, anything from take you for a scenic flight in this plane here through to uh, fly down the beach upside down looking for, looking for sharks. Well, I was just <laughs> talking to one of your staff earlier. You're actually starting a private jet company as well. That's right. We're also starting to fly, uh, like the plane that just came in, yeah. Um, yeah, twin turbines uh, where we can take anyone anywhere in Australia. Yeah, awesome. I want to get on one of those. Perfect. Okay, thanks awesome. very much, Matt. Thanks, mate. Thanks again. Some of the best learning you will ever do will be traveling. Give yourself space, time to creatively think, to learn, to meet people, or take a vacation with your family. Give yourself that time. And there's no better person or people or company to help you than the people at Tripadeal. Their experienced agents will look after you from start to finish. They will plan your flights, your accommodation, your car, your excursions, whatever you need. If you want to plan a trip of a lifetime, Tripadeal is the place to go. Tripadeal.com.au If you enjoyed this video, I know you would enjoy the audio version of Jerome Lua. Get on or in any major podcast platform, get the edge with Hayden Knowles and search Jerome Lua. You will love it.